couple of years, off and on, every five years or so, so it's really nice to be back. Uh, let's get rid of that picture. Well, I've been working on quasi control mapping for the last uh, 10 years. So uh, the problem of finding good coordinates uh, systems is one of the oldest problems in mathematics. It goes right back to uh, the time of Gauss, the greatest problem of finding uh, good orthogonal coordinate systems on orthogonal surfaces. On surfaces. Uh, so this question was finally solved by Alcorns and Bears, the famous paper measuring the rhythm mapping theorem. And uh, so around the year 1900, Gilbert made his uh, famous 20-second problem, which uh, asked to uh, unify ionization problem. And the general case was solved by Paul Kirby, and that's what we've been talking about for the last uh, day, the Rima mapping theorem. I guess everybody's heard of this. It was done in 1907. Uh, everybody knows the condition is simply connected. That's obvious. Uh, the condition which I'm going to emphasize is the boundary. Uh, in R2, the, the boundary just has to be non-empty, very, very simple conditions, so you can have terrible domains, which are uh, the uh, univalent image of the unit disk. But that's not going to be true in higher dimensions. Uh, David Hill would actually ask for higher dimensions if you read his 20-second problem. However, as uh, Chris just said, according to Lowerville, in R3, the only conformal mappings are trivial. They're just rotations, inversions, and translations, rescalings. Well, was Leobiel's theorem before Hilbert asked the question? Oh, yes. yes. He didn't know? Um, Hilbert asked a very, very general question. You know, it's okay. difficult to understand. Just says, do something for high dimensions. Okay. So instead of uh, conformal mappings, we consider K quasi conformal mappings. So PL maps, for example, things by linear maps, or uh, Diffeomorphisms. The geometric definition is that small balls go to small ellipsoids and are bound with eccentricity. I'm not going to give you a formal definition of quasi conformal mapping because I'm going, to, I'm going to give you my definition of the one I prefer uh, in a moment. Instead of uh, quasi conformal mappings, I'm going to talk about another class of functions, and these turn out to be very important. This is called quasi-symmetric mappings. The difference is very subtle. Uh, you see it uh, most obviously, the quasi-symmetric mapping can be defined from a lower dimensional space from Rn to Rn. So for example, uh, the original quasi-symmetric mappings which you allow fours, where you took the real line and mapped to a, a quasi-circle. There's once again a lot of different ways of defining this, but I'm going to give you a definition which uh, uh, really fits in best what I'm going to be talking about today. And the definition just says you take any conformal mapping. So remember these conformal mappings are just translations and rotations, very simple mappings, and renormalize it. So you just move the, uh, the origin to another point, and then you just divide through by a scaling factor. And this scaling factor then means that you've got something which is a renormalized mapping. So you get a family of mappings. So from one mapping, you rescale, just blowing up the picture, looking at it with a magnifying glass of different scales, and you get a family of mappings. Well, for something to be quasi-symmetric, you want it to, uh, uh, oh, this I, well, IJK. Uh, so the definition of quasi-symmetric is, uh, that these set of renormalizations when you blow up are going to be a, give you a family which is pretty compact in the space of homeomorphisms. So in the space of embeddings, you mean the space of diseases mass? Uh, homeomorphisms. Well, you want, you want, different from yeah. That's right. right. So oh, you, well, embedding, embedding is. Injections. Right. Continuous Right. Okay. So here are some simple facts about quasi symmetric. When the dimensions are the same, in fact, is exactly the same as quasi so a lot of people get mixed up between the two things. Uh, at various times, if you can't remember what the definition is, just ask me, and I have this, quick, uh, this sheet, this cheat sheet, which has all the definitions here, and I can put that there for you if you need that. Huh, okay, um, some famous theorems. Any quasi-symmetric mapping 
say from the sphere to the sphere, extends to a positive conform mapping of R3. So, in fact, a lot of people like to think they are exactly the same because you can always extend a quasi-symmetric mapping into a quasi conformal mapping anyway. This is the same thing with Alphors and Carlson and Tiki or a lot of people. Anyway, 1964, Alphors asked the following question, find all the domains which are quasi conformally equivalent to the new ball. So this is the best one to expect for the Riemann mapping theory in the two dimensions. Uh, he asked this question again at the ICM, I think, in 76, and Fred Gehring asked this in 86 or something at the ICM. So the question's been around for a, a long time. Uh, so uh, most of you, of course, don't really know very much about that. So let me just uh, give you some just basic, simple information to set off with. Some simple examples. Uh, any smooth ball is obviously quasi conformally equivalent to the ball. The half spaces, well, we're used to half spaces in complex analysis, and the same thing generalizes to higher dimensions. Cylinders, that's not quite so obvious. Why is a cylinder quasi conformally equivalent to the ball? Well, here's a cylinder. So, the set find all the main quasi equivalent to the ball has two possible interpretations. Which one do you mean? I'm going to do all. Uh, I'm going to do global and local. So, uh, yeah, uh, yes, true. So there's the Riemann mapping theorem, which asks for uh, quasi-conformal mappings which map the unit ball to some domain, find domains which this is true. And then there's the problem of quasi-spheres, which I'll get to in a moment, which is a global problem. Uh, you want to find uh, quasi-conformal mappings on all of R3 and characterize what they do to the unit form. And then you can both of them. They, they all come out together. There's no technical issue, not mathematics. Huh? We're getting some static on the mic because it's already against your time. I think there's a simple solution to that. No, it's some very, very simple examples. I mean, these are the sort of examples if you expect three dimensions to be like two dimensions, you think the two dimensions and three dimensions must be true. It's not true. If you have the domain between two parallel planes, that cannot be quasi conformally mapped to the unit ball. So you can finish with the cylinders. No, oh, yeah. With the cylinders, you can construct the proof. Uh, actually, you can use Dennis Sullivan's and uh, Thurston's technique of using the scribe of balls, but with a cylinder, you don't have to do anything. As complicated as that, if you just construct it, there's a sphere, just pass the problem like this bit, the last bit obviously can do it, and you just keep reflecting like this, and because maybe this transformation is preserved pass the formality, then obviously the whole thing is going to be quite what pass the problem the cylinder. Now some strange things. Uh, yes, if you're smooth with an outward cusp, like a spike coming out. No, if you're uh, smooth with an inward cut. So, I mean, now it's starting to get strange. There are some strange differences between uh, dimensions. I mentioned the global problem, so let's just be uh, explicit about that. This is to characterize a quasi sphere. And here I'm using Finnish uh, language. Uh, I have to use the language that people uh, use to talk about these problems. Uh, a quasi sphere is just the, the image of the sphere under a uh, a global quasi conformal mapping. Uh, the case in R2 was done by Al Fors, it's a famous theorem of Acta Mathematica 1964, and he characterizes, uh, uh, in the case of two dimensions, uh, these uh, quasi circles, these images of the quasi uh, circles by this quasi symmetric. The condition he has is the famous three point condition, that if you have any three points on the uh, quasi circle, then there's a constant ratio between the lengths of the side. So basically, the triangle is going to collapse. Yeah. Now, in terms of the way I like to think about this, I'm not going to think about it like that. If you think about this as under renormalization, when you renormalize 
All this means is when you renormalize these bars and circles, you always get short of the curves in the link. And that's exactly what the definition is. And so that's the point of view I'm taking. None of this generalizes, however, to uh, R3. For example, quasi-spheres definitely are the qu uh, quasi-symmetric images of, uh, of, of S2, that's true. But there are wild quasi-spheres. Um, I mean, this audience, I know, likes... Uh, I'm going to give you an explicit example of where the Jordan curve uh, theorem fails in R3. So let's imagine my body is a sphere. So I have no holes. Okay, so I start with this. When I bring my two hands together, they almost touch, it's often like that. My two fingers are like this. Then you imagine my two fingers have now become two hands, and they keep doing the same thing. You keep doing this iterating, this on and on and on, and what you get is still a surface which is a topological sphere, but its complement is now wild. It's not simply connected. If you have a loop around my hands, you can't. If I embrace my wife, she cannot get away uh, at least by breaking my, uh, my hands. So uh, that's the idea of a wild. Uh, sphere. So uh, the curious thing was, historically in two dimensions, the Riemann mapping theorem came first, then there was the theory of quasi conformal mapping, and the last was the theory of reflections. It turned out the key to understanding this was exactly the opposite. You understand reflections, then you understand quasi-spheres, the global problem, then finally you get the Riemann mapping theorem going backwards. So we're talking about reflections. We have a uh, since uh, reversing uh, homeomorphism, it's high improvement. The uh, typical example, of course, is the Euclidean reflection, a nice simple one like that. Uh, all of these guys have fixed sets. These are just the points which reflection leaves untouched. And the famous theorem of topology, but the fixed set is a topological sphere. Now, a topological sphere can be something bad. It's not necessarily embedded. Nevertheless, Smith conjectured that in this case it was always good. He was wrong. Uh, being in 19... 52 constructed an explicit example, uh, an implicit example, I should say. He asked for an explicit example. And uh, last time I was here five years ago, I had a conversation with Dennis Sullivan. He said it should also be true for Christ to perform that. It was very quick anyway. Uh, in writing, him and him said the same thing, it should be true. Well, it turned out that uh, quasi conformal reflections are, uh, in fact, tame. Uh, to understand this, let's look at the construction I gave of an explicit an explicit wild reflection. So this answers this question about well basically just want something a picture. So I now I get my props out and the first prop I got this morning is a great shot bagel. So we start with a bagel, we take the bagel, which is supposed to be a solid torus, and we cut it in half. Your hands clean, I'll eat it <laughs> But people like me, who are really two-dimensional people, you have to understand these pictures. This is a torus cut in half. That's the first step. Uh, then what we do is we draw interlocking loops. They're going to be a uh, framework for us. The next step, we borrow tunnels down these interlocking loops. So like dig a hole down here, dig a hole down there, dig a hole down there, dig a hole down there. So far, this is very almost exactly the same as what's been here. No differences. Then I uh, continue now, I draw more frameworks, but this time I go in the opposite direction. I draw more frames now coming up from there. And I now connect these frames with uh, more tubes. Now these tubes are very thin, they're so thin they just look like wires. They're the same thing. Let me show you another picture to show you schematically what's going on. This is the iterative step. At each step we have this, we have a little break here, and when we come to the break then we do the opposite thing, we go around like this. Now this process, if you just do it without thinking about it, you're not going to get a reflection. This doesn't converge normally. Now to get it to converge, you have to think a little bit hard about what's going on. And uh, this is the sort of the picture. I'm sorry, it sounds like you're building a set here. What's the mapping? Oh, well, you have to define a reflection at each step, and you have to show that it converges because you're only changing the things inside the tubes. <coughs> so you start off with your original reflection, 
which reflects the inside. Well, where's the outside of the donut, though? Yeah, the original one, the outside, infinity is nothing special. This comes in from on the inside. The surface remains fixed. And then you change your definition when you drill the holes. And you get a new reflection. So the first step, the fixed set is the torus. The inside of the torus is going to the outside of the torus. That's correct. You just, so you just get rid of it. It's really obvious the inside of the torus is the same as the outside of the torus. Oh, well, it's not the torus, it's the half torus. Half torus. The half torus is just a sphere. I mean, obviously oh, yeah. you can't reflect the inside oh, yeah. of the torus to the outside of the torus. Yeah, okay. So this is an interesting step. And uh, when you do the calculations, you find out that every, um, that you can roughly halve, it's not every step. You can halve this, the number of steps you have to do to halve, keep halving the length here, it's, uh, it slows down. And so what you get in the limit, well, I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, it looks like some little sea creature doing some interesting stuff to itself, uh, little tentacles are coming out there. If you take your mathematical knife and cut this in half and see what's going on, it looks something like this. Uh, and when you check the calculations, what you get is not quasi-conformal. It's bifolder. Uh, why is it not quasi-conformal? Well, you see in our picture, these tubes get very, very long. And we, when you rescale, uh, you find out that these things don't rescale. It's not rescalable. And one property I haven't told you, but any quasi conformal reflection must have a rescalable property. When you blow it up, you must get more quasi conformal reflections. So, there aren't any. So, that, of course, doesn't uh, show you how to uh, prove the theorem, but it uh, gives you an indication. So, the big idea of the theorem is that generically, this example is what happens. You have these long tubes. They're very small tubes, they're very long. You have to learn how to work these out. Well, here are the actual steps. Uh, you can assume it's a binding shift reflection, which makes life easier than quasi conformal. Uh, uh, Hinehan and Yang prove that the, the complementary domains are uniform, which means you can rescale, so you can rescale on. Uh, then uh, the new stuff. You start to approximate what I call uniform handle bonds. So if you have two parts of the, the, the fixed set coming close together, you approximate it by a torus, which uh, copies it like this. So let me show you a picture of something. Set coming close together like that, then you're approximating a uh, handle would look like this. Remember, it's just three dimensions, so it goes like that. Now, this case is very interesting because these two parts of the fixed set are, are disconnected. So, if I have a finite resolution, in fact, they'll break. Now, we know the fixed set is a topological sphere, so if you have five and finite resolutions, they always do break. Uh, and so, you, the torus then becomes linking things like this. So, you've got these linking loops. Idea yeah, you're approximating by uniform handle bonds. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the one hand, the other hand is supposed to be a sphere. The, the fixed set is a topological sphere. So when you have higher resolution, one of two things happen. Like you have knots, and let's not talk about that, but I proved that there aren't any knots in this case. Or you have interlinking parts of the domain, which is a link like this, and they only seem to be linked. You've got some handle here uh, connecting them. When you have higher resolution, what you end up is the two angles connecting, linking together, so you have these linked angles. So that's the picture. Um, what you want to do is then you want to have a way of measuring these handles. How do you measure handles? Uh, how do you measure a torus? How do you measure this donut? Well, you can take out your ruler and do this. But another way of doing this is to use string theory. Uh, this morning I was looking for some strings, and I found you can't find the strings in Port Jefferson. So I wasn't just wearing this tie because it looks good. Uh, it was the only thing I had. Uh, this is my string. And if I have a torus, this goes around the length of the string. And that is the length of the torus. Uh, okay. Now what happens if I have something interlinking like this? Uh, two handles. Well, this is getting a little bit dangerous now. <laughs> but I have two interlinked handles. I use, have to use two strings. If you need two discs, use find the two buttons. <laughs> and uh, oh, this has to be a double loop because remember there's a symmetry here because this is a domain of reflection, so everything on one side. This picture didn't show it, but it also comes down on the other side, so you get something which loops around like that. So in this situation, I've got these two linked handles. Uh, I'm experiment with this in my bedroom. Anyway. <coughs> Here we go. Here we go. So we have this situation like this. 
two linked handles. Unfortunately, uh, I can't show you anything more because I'm running out of things. <laughs> okay, uh, fundamental ladder. The fundamental ladder is that you find uh, limits of these things to give you what I call a span of the link. I mean, you take all possible things, you take the infinitum mode of Maybe this is not the place to go into that, but uh, you take the infinitum mode of possibility. Basically, it's the length. So if this is a span of this handle body, then the fundamental lemma says that I can find a sub-handle body with at least the same length. But this is true, because look, one of these guys, the tie, is actually longer than the whole thing together. Fundamental theorem. So this enables us to keep rescaling. We start off with a handle body of a certain span. We find there's a sub-handle body and we have higher resolution with at least the same span. We keep doing this until we get a sequence of these things where the span is bigger than a certain number. Uh, but the, Actually, the span can't go down. The span can't go down. As you refine. As you refine. However, I didn't prove a theorem, uh, well, a lemma here, that shows that um, this can't happen. The handles um, get smaller. So that's, that's a contradiction. So there are no wild uh, reflections. So this enables you to actually give a characterization of these domains of reflection. A domain of reflection is one for which you can find a, a bi-quasical uh, form of reflection. Uh, basically, if you know there are no wild reflections, what you uh, can do is rescale, and you get the definition of something I call a uniform sphere. The sphere is uniform when you uh, put a magnifying glass, it'll keep blowing it up, blowing it up, blowing it up, blowing it up you always get a topological sphere, an embedded sphere. Um, an equivalent way of doing this is... There's our uniform sphere. I don't know if you could, but I mean, you just take the round sphere and start blowing it up, you get a half plane. Right, it. right, which in R3 hat is the same as a sphere. Okay. We're doing everything in R3 hat. So you always add that point of infinity. In the oh, yeah, we always sphere. do that. We always do that. So equivalently, at every, at every scale, you can uh, sandwich Market. between the domain. Oh, it makes sense to you, I'm sure. Okay, fine. Well, uh, equivalently, uh, a sphere has this uniform property. And if at all scales you can draw a uniform polyhedra, sort of like two hand rooms, which squeeze the surface between them. So, we have this, this definition of this. So, this allows you to actually characterize these big sets of these reflections. And we get this. Uh, Theorem that uh, T is a fixed set of the positive form of reflection from the entity and the sphere. Uh, well, we already have it one way. No wild reflections means that uh, the fixed set is a topological sphere. Because it blows up nicely when you renormalize, you get one way, so it is a uniform sphere. The hard part about this theorem, once you have theorem one, is a convert, which is a really horrible construction, PL construction, which, you know, which makes me unsure whether it generalizes a high dimension. PL construction. Uh, this, as it turns out, also characterizes the fixed set of bi Lipschitz reflection problem, which is in the in PEs and various problems like that, turn out to be exactly the same. It helps characterize quasi-spheres. Now, remember what quasi-spheres are, you probably forgot. So let's put up our cheat sheet. Uh, there's the zoo. The zoo, uh, we have our quasi conformal reflections. Talk about those first. And the fixed set turned out to be this uniform sphere which we can blow up. The quasi sphere is the image of the sphere under quasi conform mapping of all of R3. And finally, at the end, I hope to get to Bruno mapping theory, which is, which is this thing. So let's keep that up there so we can remember what's going on. Uh, so we're going to characterize quasi spheres. Before we get to that, though, I guess I want to. The problem is something which doesn't happen in two dimensions. This is the difference between two dimensions and three dimensions. We'll see some more of this later. Uh, a uniform sphere is one where you blow it up and you get a sphere. That's a kind of topological condition. It turns out if you parameterize your, your sphere from S2 and uh, blow up the parameterization, that need not uh, be uh, renormalizable. There are actual examples where you can't blow up the renormalization. It's a very strange thing. And that turns out to be the right condition. Right, even though you can go up the set. And a simple example of that is a quasi-circle cross-out. So here's the theorem. 
so the first condition uniform sphere we had from reflections. So to be the quasi conformal image of the, 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 uh, the sphere, to be the extra condition quasi uh, symmetric, this was our force condition in two dimensions. It's not true by itself. There are examples in uh, three dimensions where you can have a wild quasi symmetric sphere. Uh, but the uniformity is the extra condition. So it's topological and uh, metric conditions. There's two, two conditions in the unit. Okay, uh, the Riemann mapping theorem then is going to be a one sided version of this. We've got the, the uh, global theorem. So, once again, we're talking about the difference between two and three dimensions. Uh, one difference between two and three dimensions is that in two dimensions, if you take a simply connected domain and blow it up at a point, <coughs> if you do it in the right way, you always end up with a simply connected domain. You can't have holes coming in in two dimensions. In three dimensions, you, you can always do that. Let's take a balloon. Bring our fingers in here to form a torus. And so you can always, in three dimensions, you can take a topological ball, renormalize it, and obtain a, uh, something which is not simply connected. So simply connected is not a, a nice uniform property, unlike three dimensions. So, unlike two dimensions. So we need to have something about that. But how does that really process the Oh, yeah. The, the picture looks too good. What I actually have to have is like a half space with my fingers coming up marching along off to infinity mode. And as I, as I follow my fingers, then the fingers come closer and closer together until in the limit you get the torus. So you don't see the rest because they're so far away. But, uh, you know, you the the yeah, yeah. So you, so you have to renormalize in any possible direction and rescale only if that you want. As long as the boundary is always a certain distance away, you don't want to lose the boundary completely, which of course you could do. Uh, okay, so the first property then, uh, remember a quasi ball is a, the, the, the ring arm mapping theorem, which we're interested in. And we define the property of uniformly simply connected, which means that when you blow up, you only get uh, simply connected domains. So it's a theorem that these quasi conforming images of the ball are actually uniformly simply connected. So you can blow them up. But we know that's not enough, because even for a, even for a global problem, that's not enough. Block is not enough. So we have to have boundary conditions. And this is profoundly different from two dimensions, because in, in two dimensions, you really don't have any boundary conditions at all. You'll have to have rays going out to infinity and sorts of weird things. That's not true in three dimensions. I mean, the boundary is going to be fairly nice. Uh, many years ago, Gehring actually gave uh, the necessary condition on the boundary, and this already this necessary condition uh, is kind of surprising. So Gehring's <coughs> necessary condition is that the boundary is locally really connected. What that means is that for any two points on the boundary, there exists a set in the boundary <coughs> continuum. So that the diameter of this set is comparable with the distance between the boundary. This, this definition of locally really connected straight away rules out some of our favorite simply connected domains in two dimensions. Remember the crocodile's teeth, where you have a series of rays going down <coughs> and clustering on an infinite line. This is not locally really connected because the tips, as you get closer and closer, they get smaller and smaller. And the only way to connect the tips is by going all the way around the rays, and so it's not locally really connected. So examples like that are not quasi balls in two dimensions. It has to have this property. So we have these two known properties, uniformly simply connected, locally literally connected. This means that, in fact, the, the mapping from the unit sphere always extends to the boundary. Uh, the theorem is actually due to Zorich. Uh, and for those of you who know about prime ends, it's actually prime ends, but for those of you who don't, just pretend it's just looking down. This is the father. This is the father. 
And Novikov knew a lot about this. He was very helpful. He has a photographic memory. So all the seminars that's happening in Moscow in the 60s, total recall. That's strange. Uh, one example is already known. This was done by one of the Finns, 1988. He has a necessary and sufficient condition for something to be a quasi-conformal image of the inner ball, uh, but it's only for cylinders. So here's an example of a cylinder. Here's an example of a cylinder. So the domain cross, well, this is a short cylinder. It actually doesn't really matter whether it's a short cylinder or a different cylinder. Here's a cylinder. And Vassilov's theorem in, uh, in Actor in 1988 says that this is a quasi-ball if and only if the boundary is parameterized by something quasi-symmetric. We've already seen quasi-symmetric for the global problem, but this is not quasi-symmetric in the Euclidean metric. This is quasi-symmetric in the inner distance metric. You take the length of the curves around the inside. Obviously, a quasi-ball could go around and touch itself, and so you can't uh, have the ordinary Euclidean metric as the one you want. So this is the theorem. We're going to find out this theorem generalizes uh, the, and we'll find out what the general theorem is. So, the main theorem then is that there is a metric, but it's not this guy. This guy doesn't work in general. Uh, the metric is something called a Gromov metric. They occur in geometry quite a lot. Uh, a Gromov metric it has to be constructed for each domain. So the metric actually depends on the domain. It's not something intrinsic like the hyperbolic metric. You find the Gromov metric, you prove a theorem which says that these domains are like trees. You have these trees, and the connecting parts of the trees are polyhedral. Uh, Dennis Sullivan was talking about using balls to describe it. I believe you can't do it with balls. You have to do it with uniform polyhedra. And you use these uniform polyhedra, you can paste together a tree structure which gives you the, the metric on this domain. Uh, so the, uh, the, the metric has to be constructed for each domain. In several cases, like the ball, it actually is the same as a hyperbolic metric, more or less. So this is what a quasi ball looks like. It looks like a tree. You get the octopus and arms going up there. You might have more thick things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Rocks put, 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 put one more to show the idea. You have a log hit in another, another airport. And they can twirl around each other. Right, right. They can twirl around each other. And at every point... Like the thick thin decomposition. At every point you can put a nice fat polyhedron which almost touches the boundary. And it cuts off all the branches, a finite number of big thick branches, uncounted thick ones. And this gives you a, a tree structure, like that. Makes everything together. And uh, this tree structure is then used in the form of the Gromov metric, which very, very roughly is just count the number of steps and weight them by a geometric ratio, C to minus thing like that, and that tells you how far you go. So, so going along one long thing counts one. It's always finite, yeah. So you always get so to the boundary. Going along one long thing counts one. One long worm. No, it doesn't. You have a you have a you have a you have a, an origin, an infinity. It's it's, it's not scale invariant. What do you say? Well, you can fix a point that's called... We just had a regular round cylinder that was a unit disk cross an interval that you have two points end apart. Right. And how far apart are they? Well, you have to fix a point that's called the origin. That's where C0 is. So that's where it's... Uh, you go one step. So here, you have weight C. Okay? So the next point, we have C squared. The next point, we have C3. And so on like that. So you count the number of steps from this point. Um, that's, so that's when X is... Uh, Oh. Here and Y is there. When X is there and Y is there, you start here. C10 or whatever it is, and count the steps from there. But what is the set of one step? Yeah, one, one step is one. Is it being a huh? Yeah, one step is one, but it's weighted by C to the minus set where you started, and depending on where you started from. The, the, no, but the whole long branch only counts the fixed amount. Yes. This is geometric series. Right. Put it in your series to make it. Uh, so what we get is then this theorem, which um, well it solves the problem. Um, we have uh, something as a quasi ball if and only if it's, there's a topological condition, it's uniformly symmetric, and so it rescales. And the boundary is quasi symmetric, it's a Gromov sphere. By the way, this is not the only condition. 
um, Bruce Kleiner and Mario Bonk have conditions for something to be quasi symmetric. So you can use their conditions if you want. So you can replace the Gromov sphere thing by it has to have a thick boundary capacity, something or other. Uh, there's other conditions as well, but they're all equivalent. And in the end, this seems to be about as good as anything. Uh, so what I thought I'd finish up then is uh, look at some examples for this. Uh, the first one is a, a corollary. Uh, here we have Vassilis condition. Uh, the Bremov metric sounds a little bit pro problematic. I mean, what is it? You can construct it in various cases. But it turns out if you work with weaker metrics, the same theorem works. But instead of getting necessary and sufficient, you just get a uh, sufficient condition. So, for example, if you've got a domain uh, which is uniformly simply connected again, that's Vassala didn't have that in this condition. Because if you have a cylinder, a cylinder is automatically uniformly simply connected. So it wasn't there. Uh, the next example comes from the construction of Sullivan, uh, something I call Manhattan. So here's Manhattan. So let's construct a, a, a group pattern of Manhattan. Um, you've got, it doesn't have to be rectangular, but the, the, the idea is that the, the, the city block shouldn't become too long or thin, they should be bounded. But whatever that is, and above each city block, you raise a skyscraper. It can be as high as you want. It can go to infinity. So that's, in, that's uh, Manhattan. You can prove that this is uniformly simply connected. It's not so hard to do. You can prove that the boundary is, uh, is uh, quasi symmetric in, in whatever metric you know, prefer to play with. So you can flatten Manhattan with a uh, single quasi conformal mapping. And uh, we have that example. Uh, Chris asked me uh, when he was floating me if I had any other examples. And we were talking about brains earlier on. And my first indication was, my first thoughts about this is that the brain is not a quasi ball. But then I thought about it a little bit harder, with some better pictures, cross sections and things. And it seems like maybe it is. So let's think about a sphere as our starting point. Start with a sphere. And suppose this is a very bad way to have a brain. You have skyscrapers coming out of our head like this, going, some of them very long. Well, biologically, that's not a very good idea to look like a an antelope or something like that. So a more efficient way is to wrap these things around your head. And uh, that looks like what's happening to the brain. So it's a quasi uh, ball. Uh, the construction of the mapping on the inside using a tree structure actually might be a more efficient way of getting the parameterization on the boundary, rather than starting off with the boundary parameterization and uh, going to get the material. OK, well, I think that's all I want to say.
is around gold, and maybe you could write down a parameterized family that sort of gets every possible tree structure and then say every quasi ball or every domain is like a quasi image of something. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, I, I thought about that. I mean, so there's, there's different categories, for example, half spaces. You could consider everything which is quasi conformally equivalent to a half space, but uh, if you saw the proofs, they're very long. The, the idea of a, the, the different categories of things just open on our own. So. Answers I don't know. Well, the other thing was that Grant, which is funny, the workshop actually had a lot in it about three dimensional domains. But all the work that we've done on Earth is about two dimensional domains. <laughs> I felt like we had to invite data to that. Something well, 3D. The, the, the big picture here is that you can quasi conformally map in the interior. If you can quasi conformally map, well, quasi conformally, I have to put quotes there and that, you're bound. So the boundary is basically a ring on sphere. And that's surprising. Well, one thing I guess I'd like to know is if we had a, like a polyhedron with many sides, if it, if it was a QC visual ball, or suppose you have like a 10,000 gon in yeah. free space, and I want to replace it with a 100 gon that has basically the same shape. Uh -huh. Where I don't know what basically the same shape means, but somehow if I'm estimating the harmonic measure of the boundary, trying to solve the Dirichlet problem, I get pretty much the same answer in the interior points if I remove 99% of the facets and just solve the simple problem. So I'm staring at your theorem, wondering if it's sort of if I take a domain and build this tree structure inside and then clip off the fingers or the things that maybe are unimportant in some sense. That's actually how I'll a get principle. Simplified. See, um when you use your PL construction, it's very long, thin slabs, very thin slabs. It's almost in some very weak sense like we're seeing in the normal direction. So you don't have big regular um, polyhedron when you do this, despite my picture. You have long, thin ones, flat slabs. Going around like that. So you do get a deformation. I mean, you do prove that these things come by. Yeah. So, um, so back to the brain. Okay, you said a uh, ball with an inward pointing cusp yes. is not a quasi ball. That's correct. And what I mean, about it has to be a real cusp. It has to have something with zero angle. Okay. If it just has positive angle like it has those. Right. The ridge. It's, it's a ridge. The ridge is okay. Well, that's what I was going to ask about. Okay, so a, a spike with a, it comes to just a right. zero angle. So if you look at roots and and things, they, they seem to have spikes coming out. What about a channel where it comes to zero angle, but it's The same kind of thing, actually. That's a half space. Because remember, we have to have this renormalizable condition. So if you have a long channel which cusps in like this, yeah. then you blow it up and you follow this in, this will, in the limit, end up as a this space between two planes. And that will also fold. Well, just it think of a sword fight. Piercing someone is not a quasi ball, but slashing them is fine. So you got a ridge through something, that's not me personally. So if you poke a hole in something, that's not good, but if you slash a one-dimensional thing through it, that's fine. Is that, is that right? Could a, the, a, a, a line like cusp is okay. So let's say the brain has a line like furrow down the middle. Right? If, if it's an angle, it's okay. Yeah. If it's not an angle, if it's an actual zero angle, it's not okay. Even if it's a slab. Well, actually, there's actually two things you've got to be a little bit careful. I'm not quite sure whether you're talking about the interior or the exterior. You see, if you're talking about the exterior, then it's not okay. If you're talking about the interior, then it's a different question. Because, I mean, you can have a, a nice topological ball where you can map the inside quasi conformal onto the, onto the unit ball, but you can't do that for the outside. Now, that's not true for the global, for the global things, but, well, obviously, I mean, if you have these things going out to infinity, you can map the inside of something which is going to have to but you can't map the outside of the thing. So well, you just take an apple and cut a slice through it, not remove anything, but just insert a half plane that sticks halfway through it. What's left is now sort of wraps around. Mm -hmm. That's the quasi form of the ball. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, for one thing, you take that slice and you could just open it like this, and now it's a half a sphere and a half sphere. More questions? I think we should come up and draw a picture on the blackboard for the last one. Let's thank the speaker again.